Hi, it's Ross Pluskin here, and it's the end of a very busy production day here at TSA, and I'm finally getting the opportunity to put my feet up, sit down, and enjoy one of the many wonderful display systems we have here at our, at our retail facility. You know, we're gonna be continuing our running series today uh, when it comes to understanding different types of fish, but as opposed to talking about a whole big general fish family, uh, we're gonna be continuing um, in exploration and one of the ones we've already explored and discussed in a previous episode. And we're gonna be kind of narrowing down to one specific species, that species. Today, we're gonna be talking about the chalk bass. Uh, what, in my opinion, one of the most wonderful ceranids uh, available in the reef aquarium hobby today. We'll be discussing a little bit about its biology, what it shares with the rest of its uh, family, the serenity as a whole, and then some things about its specific biology that, in my opinion, make it uh, a really appropriate and overwhelmingly beneficial uh, candidate for being a, an ornamental aquarium species. So, let's talk real briefly about the serenity something we discussed in a previous episode. The groupers, the sea bass, in this case, the basslets. Now, there's two big general types of serranid. We have, let's say, the goliath groupers, the snowy groupers. Think uh, your food fish and your sport fishing groupers. These are large, large fish that can get over several hundred pounds uh, in size and grow over several feet in length. Um, this is in contrast, the other main subfamily of the serranidae, and that is the Antheony. We talked about them in a previous episode as well. Members of the Antheus. Still serranids, but in contrast of those big goliath groupers, they're much smaller in size generally, uh, exist in larger social groups than mostly the more solitary larger groupers, and they have a very demanding uh, feeding requirements because in the wild, they're essentially a canary on a treadmill constantly working in these upwelling zones, eating a wide variety of high quality copepods and fish eggs and other live foods. So in general, when it comes to serenity, we have kind of this dichotomy that if taken at face value can be a little unhelpful when it comes to selecting the right serenity for your aquarium. We seem to have these large charismatic, but way too large predatory fish like the goliath groupers and the snowy groupers they're all fun for a while, but after a few months, let alone a year, they're large enough to eat a wide range of cleanup crew. Another year, they're big enough to eat a wide variety of fellow fish in the tank, making them largely well more appropriate to fish only, much larger aquariums. Uh, you compare that to the Antheus, where you know they can be physically put into a smaller aquarium, but they have such demanding water quality and feeding foraging requirements that you are really recommended to have larger aquariums with higher levels of flow and higher, more continuous availability of live feeds to satisfy the sensitive antheus. So in conclusion, we kind of have big, large predatory groupers that are easy to feed, hard to house. And then we have antheus, which are hard to house and hard to feed. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a serranid that kind of reconciled and married the beneficial attributes of both types of serranid, long story short, making a grouper in a very small package that stays small, that still has a big old cardiac stomach that is very easy to feed and isn't nearly as finicky and isn't going to starve to death if it goes a few days without food. And for that, we really have the chalk bass to be a wonderful hallmark example of something that fuses uh, the beneficial attributes of those other types of serranids while leaving some of the more undesirable qualities when it comes to keeping them conveniently in an aquarium, leaving them behind. The chalk bass, or Serranus tortugarum, was discovered and named after the Tortugas Islands off the coast of the Florida Keys. So this fish, in contrast to a wide variety of other fish commonly available in the reef aquarium industry, is not native to the Indo-Pacific. It is actually an Atlantic and Caribbean species. So this fish can be seen and observed in the wild everywhere from Southern Florida and the Florida Keys all the way down through the Caribbean, and even entering into Central and Northern South America. It's a fish that can exist in a wide range of depths. Snorkelers can see this fish at six to 20 feet 
The majority of specimens are found under 20 feet, but there have also been specimens that have been found as deep as over 200 feet down. One thing that really makes them uh, a superpower fish as far as being able to survive is that they share that same digestive system, that same charismatic, big cardiac stomach as let's say their cousin, the Goliath grouper. What does this mean in English? Why do we care? Well, a large cardiac stomach and a relatively short intestine means that one of these chalk basslets can consume a large prey item or a few larger prey items, such as frozen mysis or even a larger shrimp. They can cook down that prey item and basically turn it into serrated tissue and chalk bass tissue relatively easily, meaning that a single feed per day for these guys will provide more than enough energy to provide them with not only what they need to survive, conduct normal metabolism, but even have an ample, abundant surplus for continuing growth. In the wild, chalk bass can be found in silty environments, on rubble, rocky bottoms, and often hiding in the shells of, of mollusks and whelks and conchs. Uh, this explains also the natural feeding habits in the wild, as they are charismatic feeders of small fish, small crustaceans, small worms, and other small inverts. Uh, they rarely exceed three inches in length, so for the most part, the chalk bass is a fish that stays relatively small, stays within the structure of larger reefs, and really enjoys feeding on things that are overwhelmingly not that big, but at the same time, doesn't necessarily need to eat copepods and other really small forms of microfauna. Chalk basslets are considered very beginner friendly in the reef aquarium hobby because they are so willing and ready to accept a wide variety of commonly available frozen and formulated feeds. Things that we've tried successfully at Top Shelf Aquatics include frozen PE mysis, frozen thawed enriched Artemia brine shrimp, but it should also be kept in mind that some of these fish can be weaned on to higher quality pellets such as TDO and other higher quality formulated feeds. But it should also be noted that these fish are invertebrate feeders and can and will enjoy a wild forage in an aquarium if certain things are available such as amphipods, smaller polychaetes, possum shrimp, and isopods. So being able to provide supplemental hunting opportunities for your basslet is a great way to make sure it's always looking plump and fabulous. These biological attributes directly translate to how well the average chalk bass does in the average reef aquarium. It doesn't get over three inches long, meaning it doesn't require a 100 gallon plus aquarium to grow into. It can adopt a wide variety of commonly available frozen feeds right off the bat, so it very often doesn't require specialized attention when trying to get it to start feeding. Though they can be a little bit territorial to each other at times, for the most part, they are relatively unaggressive fish. And even though they are invertebrate feeders, their small mouths mean that they pose a relatively minimal threat to larger members of the cleanup crew as well. Another fascinating attribute of the chalk basslets, especially in contrast to some of the larger groupers that we also see in the Atlantic, is that like mo many other reef fish, the chalk bass exhibits hermaphrodism. It can exhibit both male and female forms throughout its life. Other forms of reef fish, let's think clownfish and the pomacanthids, the angelfish, have a more socially driven uh, arrangement when it comes to which individuals dis display which sex at any given time. This is in contrast to the chalk bass and several other small micro groupers and that they exhibit simultaneous hermaphrodism and that an adult chalk basslet can actually be a functional male and female at the same time. This is something which has fascinated and vexed fish biologists. We're trying to understand how this dual nature of the sexes uh, has ramifications in how the chalk bass undergo their social dynamics and more specifically, how they select their mates. Now, this is relatively poorly understood, but for the most part, uh, it can be concluded, especially as we see here, the chalk bass, unlike other groupers, commonly can exist around each other without abject aggression being displayed. Now, when it comes to their actual spawning, because there is no definitive male and definitive female during that one spawning event, chalk basslets, like other simultaneous hermaphrodite serranids, have exhibited a behavior that scientists are now calling egg sharing 
where essentially they take turns being both, where one chalk basslet will present itself and secrete eggs that the other chalk basslet will secrete sperm, fertilize, and allow waft into the tide, and then they'll change turns, and the other one will secrete the eggs and the other the sperm. This is fascinating because both fish, in theory, are able to double their reproductive potential at any given time. But just like other hermaphrodites that we see in the reef aquarium hobby, Bergia come immediately to mind. Even though they are functionally male and female at the same time, it has not yet been recorded an instance where a chalk basslet fertilized itself, and they are still dependent on one another to achieve successful reproduction. Speaking of successful reproduction, the chalk basslet does not enjoy an extremely intense demand in the reef aquarium industry, hence it is still available, widely available, relatively cheap, but many companies foreseeing the increased demand of this wonderful species over time, uh, a colleague of mine comes to mind, Mr. Till Deuce over in Bogus del Toro, uh, Panama, is actually working with these species and has figured out ways to get them to spawn in captivity and actually rear the larvae out through metamorphosis. This is very exciting because as more and more people see and recognize the chalk basslet as a wonderful example of a relatively cheap fish that can be successfully kept and purchased in even a smaller, more conservative sized aquarium, demand is sure to rise in the future, especially as increased uh, collection of chalk basslets occurs. And it's very, very encouraging to know that there are companies working with this species and working towards being able to produce it sustainably aquacultured. This is wonderful when comparing it to the larger groupers that we also have to keep in mind enjoy tremendous food value. Millions of groupers will be raised and aquacultured just for the food market, so it's no big deal if a select handful of pretty ones enter the reef aquarium hobby. Now, with the people such as the average aquarist loving and enjoying the chalk basslet, us loving and enjoying the chalk basslet in the context of our coral reef production, and with people like the good people at Focus Mariculture, producing and aquaculturing uh, chalk bass uh, fully, we can uh, really see a future where this fish will be ever more appreciated and be offered uh, in an increasingly sustainable way. So, in conclusion, the chalk basslet, Serranus tortuguera, a species that stays small and can be fit into a relatively modest sized aquarium, a species that shares the charismatic and ravenous feeding behavior of larger groupers and can take a single feed and survive days, if not a week plus, on that single larger feed, but at the same time, doesn't grow to those massive sizes that a massive larger grouper does, um, but at the same time as well, doesn't have the nuanced, extremely high metabolism feeding demands as let's say its cousins in the Antheony. Chalk bass are infamously known as being beginner friendly. They are ravenous feeders. They don't like to starve to death. They can handle big swings in nutrients. They can handle a wide range of flows and light intensities. Yes, they're very hard to kill, unless they jump. They can't handle life without water. So the chalk basslet, a wonderful beginner fish that can be enjoyed by novices and adept reef aquarists alike. I love this species and I hope you do too. I would love to end this episode with a question. How many of you keep the chalk basslets? Do any of you keep an Atlantic or a Caribbean biome tank that you like to use the chalk basslets in? Even though they are relatively cheap, would you pay a little more to have a fully aquaculture chalk basslet in your tank? It's a curious line that all reef aquarists must walk moving into the future. Um, and without further ado, please like, subscribe, feed the algorithm like a hungry chalk basslet slurping down an entire cube of frozen PE mysis, and we will see you next time.